Are those that's what I think they are? Yep. Oh my god. Oh goodness. You know, they had these beds laid out, and I didn't realize it when I was looking at them. I thought that's where they slept, but it was their family members who had died um, that were piled on these beds under blankets. I'd never seen a dead person before, so it hits home to you that we weren't that far from being the same. Tara is 5,000 miles from home, face to face with a small group of strangers who are in the throes of an unimaginable tragedy. They don't speak English. Tara doesn't speak Japanese. The only thing they share is a common humanity. What were they able to communicate Sadness, to you? Um, but still love because, you know, they offered food to us. They made special little rice balls for everybody so they could, you know, eat them. And I mean, it's the generosity I was astounded by. It is a remarkable moment of grace and dignity. Tara and Mike decide to try to make their way to the inland city of Tono, 27 miles away. This is it. This is the last we will likely ever see of Atsushi. The heartbreak is not limited to Otsuchi. Inside the Fukushima plant, many workers don't know if their families have survived or if their homes are even still standing. It's a horrible burden for those trying to avert a nuclear disaster. The challenge of the task and the spirit of the workers is captured by plant employee Machiko Otsuki. She writes, We carried on working to restore the reactors with the realization that this could be certain death. There are many who haven't gotten in touch with their family members. At Fukushima, the situation inside the plant is deteriorating. The incident is elevated to a level four accident. The workers are most concerned about unit one, where cooling systems are out and fuel rods are overheating. It could have severe core damage and a much larger, much larger accident. Conditions inside the 65 foot tall steel reactor vessel are unstable. Even though the plant isn't operational, fuel is still releasing huge amounts of heat. Normally, fresh water circulates through the vessel to prevent overheating. But without power, the water is heating up, evaporating, and turning to steam. As the water level drops, the rods that encase uranium fuel pellets become exposed. The temperature reaches 2,200 degrees, triggering a chemical reaction in the superheated water. Hydrogen gas is created. The pressure inside the reactor keeps growing. That chemical reaction is exothermic, which means it adds heat to an already bad situation. The operators are worried about a full meltdown. They could lead to a catastrophic release of highly radioactive material into the environment. To reduce the pressure, they try to vent the steam and hydrogen out of the reactor. The procedure books weren't helping that much anymore. So now they're trying to use their judgment to best manage a rapidly degrading, dangerous situation. Somehow, the incredibly volatile hydrogen gas is collecting in the outer building. 3.36 PM. A massive blast rips through Unit 1. A huge cloud of metal, concrete, and possibly radioactive particles is blown into the sky. The accident is suddenly looking like a full-blown nuclear disaster. The crisis at the Fukushima nuclear facility seems to be spiraling out of control. The focus is on trying to prevent another massive explosion, like the one that blew apart the reactor building in Unit 1. How dangerous was the explosion? Well, if you're local to the explosion, it's the debris of the steel falling out of the sky. Uh, I mean, huge multi-ton pieces of steel that were thrown up hundreds of meters and it fell down. 
Officials from the Japanese utility company TEPCO tell the world that the radiation release from the explosion is modest. But the charred remains of Unit 1 raise fears that the situation is worse than it seems. A full meltdown is a real possibility. To avoid this ultimate nuclear nightmare, and without any fresh water available, engineers make a desperate call. Seawater will be used to cool the reactors. Because there's no power, they bring in fire trucks and will use their pumps to get water into the reactor vessel. When engineers have to bring a fire truck into a nuclear reactor to cool it down, that is not a good day. The injection of seawater is basically game over. Game over because the salt water will damage critical systems, rendering the plant useless. Somebody may have told the boss, I'm just, I'm going to ruin a $5 billion plant here, OK? Because it causes severe corrosion, right? Right, right. So units one through four will never run again. The footage of the Unit 1 explosion plays again and again on television and the internet. Tara Millen, Mike Voss, and the team from Sea Shepherd watch the crisis unfold from a hotel. After a harrowing 13-hour walk, they were able to hitch a ride to the city of Tono. They're exhausted and in a state of shock. Now the news of an explosion and the threat of radiation is almost too much to bear. Were you truly concerned about exposure to radiation? We certainly were. You know, we said, well, let's get as far away from this area as we possibly can, you know, because I didn't realize up until that point that the radiation was that bad until people in Tono were, were panicking. At that point, it just didn't seem like reality anymore. Our minds were just, you know, we need to get home and we need to get out of here. Mike, Tara, and their colleagues find a ride out of Tono. Before long, they'll be on a flight home. At Fukushima, the crisis is developing on multiple fronts. The cooling pump in Unit 3 fails. The water level inside that reactor is dropping, and the pressure is rising. But before they can add water, they must release gas. The pressure inside the reactor vessel is 1,000 pounds per square inch. The firewater pumps can't develop that much pressure. So there was a need to reduce the pressure in the reactor vessel down to below the point where the pumps could actually send water into the reactor vessel instead of being stuck pumping and deadheading against such high pressure. In order to reduce pressure, there are relief valves on the main steam lines that the workers can open to bleed off some of the pressure, kind of like on an air uh, car tire. You open up the valve, you allow some air to come out of the tire. The workers will open up the relief valves, bleeding off pressure of the reactor vessel down to the point where the makeup pumps could do their thing and inject seawater. But before workers can even catch their breath, a hydrogen explosion blows out the top of Unit 3. 11 workers are injured. The Fukushima plant is beginning to resemble a war zone. You could see it evident in television, in all the news conferences, in the voices of the officials. And felt like the worst was yet to come. Ken Belson is covering the story for the New York Times in Tokyo, where powerful aftershocks show no signs of letting up. There were three, four, five a day, uh, some of them quite large. When you're sitting in your chair, you can't tell whether you've just sort of rolled the wheels on the chair or another earthquake's about to come. It, and that gets a little disconcerting. Back at the plant, engineers devise a new plan to vent pressure from Unit 2 it will require an incredibly dangerous mission. The engineers or plant managers sent operators up into the Unit 2 reactor building, and they took out large 20-foot panels out of the wall. They improvised it. They improvised this. Uh, they thought out of the box uh, and took that panel out to allow the hydrogen gas to diffuse out of the building. When they removed the panel, explosive hydrogen gas and steam escaped. The procedure is a success. At dawn, yet another explosion rocks the plant. The roof is blown off Unit 4. Around the plant, radiation levels spike. Iodine-131 and cesium-137 are in the air. 
threatening to penetrate workers' bodies, damage DNA, and cause sickness or cancer. You don't want to breathe it into your lungs because then you get a dose inside your body. That's why they wear suits and they wear respirators. Radiation poisoning is on the mind of American software consultant Chris Hope. He was inside the Fukushima complex when the earthquake hit. Now back home in Idaho, he's checked for radiation exposure. Nothing is found, but he's still haunted by what's happening in Japan. The experience has left him shaken and humbled. I'm kind of reliving those few minutes where I really did feel like I was going to die, you know, to have a near-death experience like that. It's an experience that I'll, you know, take with me the rest of my life. At the plant, it's an uphill battle. The Japanese prime minister appears on television to urge everyone within a 19-mile radius to stay inside and close their windows and doors. Conditions are dangerous. 750 workers evacuate. Only 50 remain to man the pumps bringing seawater into the plant. They become known as the Fukushima 50, and a worried world is watching their every move. The Fukushima nuclear power plant, once a marvel of modern technology, now looks like a war zone. Only the Fukushima 50 remain inside. Their mission is to keep fuel rods from overheating and generating gases that could trigger an explosion. They look like a small band of fighters dodging enemy fire. But this enemy is silent and invisible. Workers use Geiger counters and dosimeters to measure the danger. Each of the workers is carrying a series of dosimeters. Dr. Robert Gale, an expert on the links between radiation and cancer, has been advising officials in Japan about the current crisis. Two of the dosimeters that they wear are intended to capture external radiation. And a third kind of dosimeter is intended to try to capture the amount of radiation that's internalized that you might inhale or might ingest. The workers appear to be gaining some ground. The pressure in reactor two drops. By 6.15 a.m., a fire in unit four is no longer visible. But the morning ends with a sudden massive spike in radiation. The levels are so high workers hastily retreat. But as soon as the levels drop, they regroup and return to the plant. Their selfless dedication raises a profound question, one that Ron Fountain can answer from personal experience. As a worker at Three Mile Island, he stayed at his post as that crisis worsened. People can question, well, why, why would somebody risk their life to do it? But who else? They know every inch of their plant, how the systems work. They know exactly what to do and, and uh, how to go about it. There are actually hundreds of workers on hand at Fukushima. But because the job is considered so dangerous, only small groups are allowed inside at a time. Do you think the workers that are being rotated in and out of the Fukushima plant are prepared to die to save the plant? Oh, yes, I think some of them already uh, think they are dying. I mean, that may not be true, but they were ready to do that. That's what it would take. The oh. commitment is that great. It is. Do you consider those workers heroes? Oh, yeah, sure they are. Japanese Prime Minister Naoto Kan tells the workers, retreat is unthinkable. You are the only ones who can resolve the crisis. Many see the Fukushima workers as modern-day samurai following the ancient Bushido code of honor, duty, and sacrifice. You never have a choice. The, the way you're trained, you're just expected to go in there no matter how dire the circumstance. It's my understanding from talking to colleagues is almost the reverse. You, yes, you have a choice. Nobody has to go and do this. But they had people lined up volunteering to go. Which is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Conditions for the men are incredibly difficult. They sleep wherever they can find space. Food and water are rationed. 
radiation is a constant threat. Finally, after almost a week, reinforcements arrive. Members of Japan's self-defense force, as well as policemen and firemen. They fan out with fire trucks and riot control water cannons. The threat from the spent fuel pools remains. The pools are housed inside the reactor buildings, but massive explosions have destroyed that layer of protection. 